Okay, so what we're going to look at tonight, in response to Dale Ratzeff and facing the critics, what we're going to look at tonight, we're going to look at we are dead to the law. You know, it's amazing that it's almost like you have to go through all these objections to get to the true Bible Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? Because you got all these different objections people raise. But we're going to look at it tonight. We are dead to the law. Another argument sometimes used against keeping Saturdays, the seven-day Sabbath, is we don't have to keep the Sabbath. We are dead to the law. Now, I don't know if you've ever run into that issue, but I have. And um, it's interesting what people say about this passage we're going to look at tonight. We're going to actually quote Dale Ratzeff of what he says about this text. But I want to bring out the problem with objectors is they make these objections without thinking them through carefully. That's exactly what happens. And a lot of these objections that people raise are actually nothing new. Um, it seems like they paired it from somebody else. They've heard that before and they just kind of paired it right down the line. And so this is actually a problem I see with objectors. They don't think it through carefully. So we're going to go to the passage that they look at, and here's what they, they quote in Romans chapter 7. Notice what Paul says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. See that? That's what they look at in Romans. Dead to the law. So now I want to look at this carefully. So it, when, when, when we talk about these things in, Bible, in the Bible, we're talking about interpretations. How does people interpret the text? Because everybody's got interpretations. And so how do you interpret these texts? So an interpretation. So let's look at it carefully. Dead to the law. Let's look at that phrase carefully. Dead to the law. Does dead to the law mean that we don't have to keep the law? That's a very important question. Very important question. Because again, you see, it's a matter of interpretation. Does dead to the law mean that we don't have to keep the law? So in other words, let's define the law. Let's look at it. Dead to the law. We don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Is this what it is? Dead to the law. We don't have to keep 613 regulations. See, we're going to cover our bases carefully. We're going to look at it carefully. Okay? Is that what it means? Dead to the law. We don't have to to keep all the laws of the Old Testament. All the laws of the Old Testament. See that? That's what we're looking at. Dead to the law. We don't have to keep the whole law. In other words, we're going to hit on every kind of law in the entire Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every kind of law in the entire Bible. Dead to the law. We don't have to keep any part of the law. So I'm pretty much covering everything about whatever law it is. Yes? Ten Commandments? Dead to the law? Does it mean we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments? 613 regulations. All the laws of the Old Testament. The whole law. Any part of the law. Is that what it means? Is that what it means? So it's a matter of interpretation. You see, the problem is everybody's got interpretations. And the fact is, the fact is, all those interpretations aren't correct. They're not all correct. What we want from the Bible is the true and correct interpretation. Because everybody has interpretations. Okay? Now, when we go to Dale Ratzeff, here's what Dale Ratzeff says about this text. In Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. Here's what Dale Ratzeff says. Even Jewish Christians have been released from the law as a guide for Christian service because the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. So let's look at it carefully. The law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Romans 7, 4 through 6. Is this interpretation true? That's a very valid question we have to ask. Is this interpretation 
true? Is this what Paul means that the law no longer applies to one who has died in Christ? I'm quoting Dale Ratzliff. Is this what Paul means as to what Dale Ratzliff is interpreting? Or is this Dale Ratzliff's interpretation? See, we need to understand that. Is this what Paul means by dead to the law? Or is this Dale Ratzliff's interpretation that the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. This interpretation teaches that the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. We are dead to the law. The purpose of this argument against keeping the seventh day Sabbath is the Sabbath is in the law that we are dead to. That's what he's bringing out. Okay? Question. Is the law that we are dead to only mean the seventh day Sabbath? Now that's a very important question. Very important question. Is the seventh day Sabbath the only commandment in the law? So does dead to the law mean that we don't have to keep the Sabbath? Now remember, we're talking about interpretation. That's why they bring these texts up. To get around keeping the Sabbath. Dead to the law. I don't have to keep the law. Same type of argument people raise when they say, look, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Don't have to keep the law. We're under grace. Okay? So, does dead to the law mean that we don't have to keep the Sabbath? Isn't there more to the law than just the Sabbath? Is this what dead to the law means? We don't have to keep the law. Now, this is why they bring it up. This is an objection, and that's why I said earlier that these objectors don't think through carefully their own objection. Because we're going to see tonight that if it means... Dead to the law means we don't have to keep the law. Well, watch what happens. Here's the law. So here's the fourth commandment in the law. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the fourth commandment. That's the purpose of bringing this verse up, is to say the law is dead. I don't have to keep. All right, so let's look at the law, and let's look at it carefully. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the first commandment. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the second commandment. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the third commandment. Can you see the direction this would go? Immediately we could say something's wrong with this. Yes or no? The law is dead. I don't have to keep the fifth commandment. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the sixth commandment. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the seventh commandment. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the eighth commandment. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the ninth commandment. The law is dead. I don't have to keep the tenth commandment. Now, if you were looking at this logically, this is what it would have to be. Yes or no? Remember what Dale Ratzliff said. The law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Now that is his interpretation, friends. That's his interpretation. My question is, is this what Paul means by that? See, so if we take his point, Dale Ratzliff's point, and apply it to the law, that means the first commandment no longer applies. See that? Is that, am I see, not seeing something? Is that, do you see what I'm seeing? No longer applies. No longer applies. No longer applies. And all the way through. To be consistent, yes. So that's the whole problem with those two words, either being consistent or inconsistent. That's the bottom line. No longer applies. No longer applies. Thou shalt not steal, no longer applies. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, that no longer applies. Or you shall not covet, that no longer applies. 
based on his interpretation. The law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Unless I'm not seeing something there. Are we all on the same page? Now there's ceremonial and regulations in the Old Testament as well. Ceremonial laws and regulations. Is Paul talking about that? These ceremonial regulations. Is that what Paul's talking about? You see the Bible does make a distinction between moral and ceremonial laws. By the way, even Dale Ratzeff uses the term moral and ceremonial. And, and those guys out there who understand, they talk about this, the moral and ceremonial laws. We didn't invent these terms. Seventh-day Adventists did not invent the term moral and Seventh-day Adventists did not invent the term ceremonial. We didn't invent those terms. You see, notice how they even describe the Old Testament laws. Ceremonial laws, civil laws, moral law. The book of Leviticus contains many ceremonial laws, especially with regard to the sanctuary service and its ritual system. The nature of civil laws and the principle of justice underlying them can be seen, for example, in Exodus chapter 23, verses 1 through 9. Then there is the moral law, the Ten Commandments, which most Christians, in theory at least, believe are still God's law for all humanity. Except for one commandment, the fourth. Isn't that amazing? That's never brought up until you mention the fourth one. All ten commandments are intact for all humanity. But when you bring up the fourth one, that's why I use the word inconsistent. Or in theory. So uh, the, the Bible breaks down the concepts here that we're talking about. Moral law, ceremonial law, civil law. By the way, you remember Martin Luther? Martin Luther, the great reformer. Uh, you know, when you study history, it's amazing. Uh, the enlightenment of history, when you go back and you read some of the things by Martin Luther and the Reformation. By the way, did you know Mar Martin Luther wrote a book? I have it. I have this. I could bring it and you could read it. The Shorter Catechism of Dr. Martin Luther. I have this catechism. Martin Luther. And in this catechism, notice he has a question and answer. And listen to the question. How many kinds of law are given in the Old Testament? Answer, three. Number one, the ceremonial regulations, sacrifices, festivals, and other ceremonies. This is Martin Luther saying this. Number two, the civil law regulated political affairs. Okay? And then number three, the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Now, friends, Martin Luther said this. Now, I'm not, how old would I be if I lived during the time of Martin Luther and alive today? So I'd say Martin Luther uses the term ceremonial. Martin Luther used the term moral. You see, that was long before we came on the scene. And yet we're accused of using the words moral and ceremonial. I don't hear any of them out there arguing about the usage of these words by Martin Luther. Only when we bring it up. Only when Seventh-day Adventists talk about the Sabbath. He goes on, question, are we under obligation to keep the ceremonial law of the Jews? Answer, no. The ordinances which it enjoined were only types and shadows of Christ. And when they were fulfilled by his death and the distinction between Jew and Gentile was removed, the ceremonial law was abolished. Martin Luther said that. Now, I'm only quoting Martin Luther. Now, if I said that as a Seventh-day Adventist, they would say, look at you. Nope, nope, nope. Martin Luther said that. It's amazing the bias people have. The prejudice that people have. Question, are we under obligation to keep the moral law? Yes, 
Because that is founded on the nature of God and cannot be changed. It is of a universal application. Now remember, Dale Ratzeff said, the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Martin Luther says, it cannot be changed. It is universal in application. What's the term for apply? Application. How do you apply it? What is the definition of application? What's the definition of applying something? Here's another one, for example. Presbyterian. Besides this law, commonly called moral, ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances prefiguring Christ, all of which ceremonial laws are now obligated under the New Testament. The moral doeth forever bind all in respect of the authority of God the Creator, Neither doeth Christ in the gospel in any way dissolve. Neither are the aforementioned uses of the law contrary to the grace of the gospel. Dr. Scott, Moses wrote in a book ceremonial precepts, but God himself wrote the Ten Commandments, the moral law on the tables of stone. This difference strongly marked the permanency and perpetual obligation of the moral law and the inferior importance and temporary obligation of the ceremonial institution. So one is permanent and the other one is temporary. Listen to this guy on the Ten Commandments. The ceremonial law of sacrifices and offerings which were what? Typical of Christ. Paul so often speaks of the obligation and disannulling of the law he speaks of the ceremonial law. But moral law is universal. So let's look at contradictions. It's very important to point out contradictions and inconsistencies. Watch this. Contradictions. Del Ratzeff says this. All the moral principles found in the Ten Commandments. Now how many? Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandment Law of the Old Covenant have been repeated in the New Covenant with the exception of the Sabbath command. So if you add 10 and you take one away, how many is that? Nine. Nine commandments in the New Covenant. Now watch what happens. Nine commandments. Now is that what you understand? I, that's what I understand. I don't want to put words in your mouth. How do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying what? In the Ten Commandment law of the Old Covenant have been repeated in the New Covenant with the exception of the Sabbath. Well, if you got ten and now there's no Sabbath in that, that makes nine, correct? Nine commandments in the New Covenant. Is that how you understand it? So let's plug his interpretation right into the Bible. Let's plug it right into the Bible. And watch, for if that first covenant, that's the old covenant, for if that first covenant, ten commandments, yes, that's what he says the old covenant is, which is that first covenant. For if that first covenant, ten commandments, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So the first is the old covenant, the second is the new covenant. Can we agree to that? For finding fault with him, he saith, Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Nine commandments. He said, nine commandments of the ten are in the new covenant. You follow me? We're only taking this interpretation and plugging it right into the text. I will make a new covenant. Nine commandments with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant ten commandments that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continue not in my covenant ten commandments and I regarded them not, saith the Lord, for this is the covenant nine commandments that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws, nine commandments, into their mind and write them nine commandments in their hearts. And I will be to them a God. And they shall be to me a people. 
Remember what he said, all the moral principles found in the Ten Commandment law of the Old Covenant have been repeated in the New Covenant with the exception of the Sabbath command. So that makes nine, they're in the New Covenant, yes or no? So look over here, for finding fault with them, I will make a New Covenant, nine commandments. Verse 10, for this is the covenant, nine commandments. I will put my laws, nine commandments, into the mind and write them, nine commandments, in their heart. Nine tenths of the new covenant is actually the old covenant. According to this interpretation. Remember, he said Ten Commandments, Old Covenant? Nine Commandments would be what is repeated in the New Covenant except the Sabbath. So that would mean nine tenths of the New Covenant is actually what? The Old Covenant. Now watch this, 1828 dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, 1828. The moral law is summarily contained in the Decalogue or Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God on two tables of stone and delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 20. Now Dale Ratzliff highly recommends H.M. Riggle. And listen to what H.M. Riggle, he made the distinction between the two. Listen to what he says, ceremonial. The parents brought in the child Jesus to do with him after the custom of the law, Luke 2.27, that is to offer a sacrifice. He calls this what? Ceremonial. Now this is what Riggle says it is. Ceremonial. Moral. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers. 1 Timothy 1.9, this is the Decalogue. Decalogue means ten. Ten commandments. That's what Decalogue means. Not nine. Ten commandments. Moral, the Decalogue. So he's saying then, if the Decalogue is the moral law, and Decalogue means ten, then that means the Sabbath would be moral law. Yes or no? Not ceremonial. See, because a lot of these guys, we're going to even cover more of that, especially when I get into Colossians chapter 2. But it's amazing, these guys want to say in the Ten Commandments, all of them are moral except one, the Sabbath. It's ceremonial. Decalogue or Decalogue, it's spelled both ways. The Ten Commandments. Remember, Ken Wright, now Ken Wright was in the Adventist church for years, and Ken Wright said this, the law was given only to the Jews. When he left the Adventist church, he wrote against the church just like Dale Ratzliff does. Same type of thing. And so, um, Ken Wright said the law was given only to the Jews. Now, we already have a problem with what Del Ratzliff said because he said nine of those commandments are in the New Covenant. Nine of them are in the New Covenant. The law was given only to the Jews. So let's put it on the screen. Old Covenant, Ten Commandments, only Jews, 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 only Jews. New Covenant. Remember what Del Ratzliff said, Nine Commandments. But now how is that? How is Nine Commandments in the New Covenant is nine-tenths of the law given only to Israel, the Jews? Can you see some problems with interpretation here? Consistency versus inconsistency? Shouldn't it be this? New Covenant, Nine Commandments. For who? Christians. 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 Christians, 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 Christians. Nine Commandments for Christians. New Covenant. New Testament. New Covenant for us. With the exception of the fourth. Take the fourth completely out. So look, if you had Ten Commandments, Old Covenant, and you have nine of those Ten Commandments from the Old Covenant that was for the, the Jews only, and you plug it into the New Covenant, that means somebody has what? Changed the law of God. Yes or no? Somebody has changed the law of God. Yes? See, the law of God is Ten Commandments. Remember, the Ten Commandment law in the New Covenant with the exception of the Sabbath command. That makes nine commandments 
in the new covenant. Yes? So the law, nine of the Ten Commandments, new covenant. So law, nine of the Ten Commandments, does apply. Yes? Does apply. The second, the third does apply. But the fourth one doesn't apply. Not apply. Fifth one does apply. Sixth one does apply. Because this is now new covenant. Nine commandments of the ten. New covenant does apply. Yes? Something's wrong. The ten tenths of the law doesn't apply, but nine tenths of the law does apply. I mean, if I'm saying something that's not correct here, you tell me. If you see it, tell me. Anyone tell me. See, Dale Ratz have said the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Romans 7, 4 through 6. The Ten Commandment law of the Old Covenant has been repeated in the New Covenant with exception of the Sabbath command. That's a contradiction. Can you all see it? Is that a contradiction? So the law is in the New Covenant. Nine-tenths of the law does apply to the one who has died in or with Christ. According to this false teaching... The law, nine-tenths of the law, given to Israel only, still applies to one who has died in Christ or one who has died with Christ. So which is it? Which is it? He said even Jewish Christians have been released from the law as a guide for Christian service because the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. All the moral principles found in the Ten Commandment Law of the Old Covenant have been repeated in the New Covenant with the exception of the Sabbath command. Even Jewish, now watch this, I'm going to plug in these interpretations right here. Even Jewish Christians have been released from the law, ten tenths, ten commandments, as a guide for Christian service because the law, ten tenths, ten commandments, no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Now, am I distorting what he's saying by plugging his interpretation right into the text? So let's put it all together. All the moral principles found in the Ten Commandment Law, the law given only to Israel, the Jews only, the nation of Israel only, of the Old Covenant have been repeated Nine-tenths of the Ten Commandment law given only to Israel, the Jews only, the nation of Israel only, does apply. Now remember, I'm using their arguments. That's why I'm saying these objectors don't think their, their objections through carefully. Because they say that the law was given only to the Jews. They say that the Ten Commandments was given only to the Jews. The nation of Israel. And then they quote Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now I'm going to be going to Deuteronomy 5 and... And I'm going to be looking at these texts carefully in this subject of the Sabbath. But notice, in the New Covenant, with the exception of the Sabbath command, one-tenth of the Ten Commandment law given only to Israel, the Jews only, the nation of Israel only, no longer applies. So they've got nine commandments that was given to the Jews only, applies to Christians in the New Covenant. Isn't that amazing? Remember what Ratzel said, the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Ten tenths, ten commandment law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Romans 7, 4 through 6. Nine tenths, nine commandment law does apply to one who has died with Christ. Yes? Can you see a problem with this interpretation? So let's look at it. In Galatians 6, the Bible tells us, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, Dale Ratzliff has nine of the Ten Commandments of the Old Covenant in the New Covenant. And the first one does apply, the second one does apply, the third one does apply, but not the fourth one. The fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, and tenth, over here, does apply, except for the fourth one. Doesn't apply. So fulfill the law of Christ. Is this nine commandments, the new covenant, the law of Christ? I'm asking that question. 
You see, there's a whole bunch of misapplication, misinterpretation, misconception, contradiction, and they come to a false conclusion. False conclusion. Romans 7, 1 through 7. Now remember what Del Ratzlaff said. The law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Now we're going to go into it now. We're going to see what Paul's really talking about. Does Romans 7, 1 through 7 really prove that the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ? Now remember, this is Del Ratzlaff's interpretation of Paul. My question is, is this what Paul believes? Well, let's go to our Bible study tonight and, and go into this carefully. Romans chapter 7. Notice what Paul says in verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Do you really know the law? Do you really know it? He's saying ten tenths of the Ten Commandments was given only to the Jews. The nation of Israel only. But yet nine of those Ten Commandments given to Israel is in the New Covenant. I don't think he really knows the law. Do you? How that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Verse 3. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now watch this carefully. Wherefore, now Paul's already explained prior to this. He's saying wherefore. In other words, this is the reason. Because. Wherefore. Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto what? Death. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in a newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now watch this. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, actually proves just the opposite of those who interpret Paul's words to mean the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. Paul proves the very existence of the law by his point of marriage. If dead to the law means that the law no longer exists, then there would be no point of prohibition against adultery. True? Let's just get rid of the law. It's dead. Then there would be no point of discussion about adultery. Correct? How could there possibly be adultery, which is transgression against God's law, if the law containing the prohibition against adultery were dead and no longer applies to one who has died with Christ? By the way, Jesus said this before he ever went to the cross. Jesus said in Matthew 19, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Then long after the cross, Paul said in Romans 13, 9, he's quoting what? Thou shalt not commit adultery. And then James, long after the cross, James says in James 2, 11, what? Do not commit adultery. James says that. New Testament. So, what law are they all quoting from? Jesus is quoting from the Ten Commandments. Paul is quoting from the Ten Commandments. James is quoting from the Ten Commandments. So let's look at it. 
For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Let's ask a question. Is this commandment, do not commit adultery in the law? You tell me. Do not commit adultery. Is this a new covenant commandment? Now you want to stress that. Yes, it is. Remember what Del Ratzlaff said. We're going to ask him some questions. Remember what Del Ratzlaff said. Nine of those commandments are in the new covenant. Except one. The Sabbath. Now let's look at this carefully. Because we believe that the law here... These commandments are in this law. Right? So do not commit adultery. Is this a new covenant commandment? Does this commandment, do not commit adultery in James 2.11, apply to Christians today? Yes? Does this law in James 2.11 apply to Christians today? This law, right here. Right here, this law. You see the word law? Art become a transgressor of the law. Does this law in James 2.11 apply to Christians today? Is this law in James 2.11 that applies to Christians today the new covenant? In other words, are these commandments in the new covenant? And that law then is in the new covenant, yes? Yes. If these commandments are in the New Covenant, this law in this text is in the New Covenant. Yes or no? Is this law in James 2.11 the same law that God writes in our hearts in the New Covenant? Is it the same law? Define this law. I want Dale Ratzliff to define this law. Is this law Ten Commandments? Right here, in this text. So I'm asking the question. Now I want Dale Ratzliff to answer this question. And notice what he says, James 2.11, by way of illustration, the Ten Commandments. So he's acknowledging that this law in this text is the Ten Commandments. Not Nine Commandments. Ten Commandments. And remember, he said Nine Commandments. New covenant, except the four. But he says the law in this passage is the Ten Commandments. He says, by way of illustration, the Ten Commandments. So watch this. Del Ratzliff says this law is the Ten Commandments, by way of illustration. So do these Ten Commandments that Del Ratzliff says, by way of illustration, apply to one who has died in or with Christ or not? Remember what he said. All the moral principles found in the Ten Commandment law of the Old Covenant have been repeated in the New Covenant with the exception of the Sabbath command. And he's saying that in James 2.11 that that very law, that those two commandments are in the New Covenant, that very law is in the New Covenant. And he says that law is the Ten Commandments in James 2.11. Not nine. Ten. Remember his interpretation. I will make a new covenant. Nine commandments, he says in the new covenant. Ten, for this is the covenant. Nine commandments. My laws, I will put my laws, nine commandments into their mind and write them nine commandments in their hearts. The new covenant is the second. The first, he says, was the old, the ten commandments. The new, he says, nine of those commandments are in the new covenant. I don't buy this interpretation, do you? I see nothing but contradictions and misapplications and misinterpretations. So let's look at it. Let's put them side by side. I don't believe the Bible contradicts itself. Do you? So here you have James, which Del Ratzliff says this law here, he says he thinks that the word illustration will get him out of it by way of illustration. By way of illustration. James is using the Ten Commandments.
Either those two commandments are valid in the law of God, this very law that he's speaking of, or it's not. And notice, when we put the, what Paul says in Romans side by side with James. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. Now, if that means the law doesn't exist, and James says it does, then that would be a contradiction between James and Paul, yes or no? And I don't have a problem with what James is saying, and I don't have a problem with what Paul's saying, when you understand what does Paul mean by dead to the law. So what is Paul's points in Romans 7, 1 through 7? Now look at the context. Look at the previous and immediate context preceding Romans 7. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans 7 is following the subject of the carnal man, the slave of sin, who is unable to save himself. We can't save ourselves. And who must find salvation through the grace of God as revealed in Jesus Christ who died for us and took the penalty we deserve, death. Now this is what Paul's talking about. Watch what happens. Paul's point. The law hath dominion over a man as long as he what? Lives. Romans 7.1 Paul shows that the sinner, because he has transgressed God's law, is under the dominion of sin. In other words, sin is ruling in your life. You see that? Read Romans 6. In other words, our old sinful nature, which Paul describes as the old man, has dominion over us. The old man. The old nature. Paul declared, For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Paul knew that sin reigned in the carnal man. The carnal man is in bondage to sin. That's what Paul's talking about. And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 56? The strength of sin is the law. That shows the law is still in existence. Why is the strength of sin is the law? Why is that? Because the law tells us what sin is. The law defines sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. You see? When we transgress the moral law, the law demands judgment upon the violator. We cannot gain freedom, for we have no power within ourselves to escape from the domination of sin. In other words, sin controls us. See, Paul doesn't leave us there. That's the good news of the gospel. Watch what Paul does. Now, how do we escape from the old man of sin that holds us in bondage? By the death of this old man. By our conversion. At conversion, our old man nature is crucified. Dead. Yes? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Romans 6, 6. See, they're leaving a whole bunch of stuff out. Details. Dead to the law. Well, let's find out what Paul means by dead to the law. Now, here's the clincher right here as we go through it. Notice, wherefore, my brethren, ye... See, they leave that part out. They only look at dead to the law. They don't look at you. They're looking at simply the phrase dead to the law. Wherefore, my brethren, ye, you also are become dead to the law. Ye also are dead to the law. So how is one dead to the law? Good question, isn't it? Let's see how Paul answers that question. How are we dead to the law? How is one dead to the law? There's not only the death of the old man, there's also the birth of what? The new man. The new man. Thank God for the, the rebirth and being born again and, and the new man. 
Notice what Paul says in Romans 6. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. You're no longer under the bondage of sin. Now that's good news. That's the gospel. Changes lives, transforms lives. No longer have to be an alcoholic. No longer have to be a drug addict. No longer have to be a prostitute. No longer have to be all those things because you're a new creature in Christ, a new person. So you've got the old man and you've got what? The new man. See that? You're buried with Christ in the death of the old man and you're resurrected in the newness of life. Paul refers to this changed state of the Christian when he says to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Romans 6.11 Christ's followers have put off the old man and put on the new man. To illustrate this transition from the rule of sin to that of righteousness, Paul employs the commandment in the Ten Commandments on marriage. This is Paul's illustration on marriage. There are four points he uses. Number one, a woman. Number two, her first husband. Number three, her second husband. And number four, the law of marriage. The woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. If her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. This is what Paul's talking about. The first and most important point from which Paul proceeds at once is this. He's not speaking of the death of the law, but of the death of a husband. In fact, if the law didn't exist, and we don't have to keep the law, there would be no point if the law were dead, there would be nothing to hold the wife to either husband, the discussion of adultery would be pointless. Yes? How could there possibly be adultery, which is transgression of God's law, if the law against adultery were dead, meaning the law no longer exists, we don't have to keep the law, the law no longer applies to one who has died in Christ or with Christ, one is free to break the law. Doesn't exist. It's gone. The marriage law is not abolished in a country because a husband dies. It remains on the statute books to govern all who are married or who seek to marry. So here's a false interpretation. The law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ. True interpretation. Paul's application is of the one who has turned from sin and death to righteousness and life. That's what Paul's talking about. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Verse 4. We have been crucified with Christ. His crucified body died in our behalf. All the condemnation and guilt that the law had claimed upon our old man ends with the death of that man, Jesus the body of Jesus. Now we are free from its condemnation and can be married to Christ. We put on the new man. This is what Paul's talking about. The scholars Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown in their Bible commentary on this passage state, it is we that are crucified with Christ and not the law. This death dissolves our marriage obligation to the law, leaving us at liberty to contract a new relation, to be joined to the risen one in order to spiritual fruitfulness to the glory of God. 
Believers are here viewed as having a double life. The old sin, condemned life, which they lay down with Christ, and the new life of acceptance and holiness to which they rise with their surety and head. That's their comments on Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Because of this new union we bring forth fruit unto God. Whereas when we were in the flesh the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto what? Death. Breaking the law. That's sin. And the wages of sin is what? Death. Bringing forth fruit unto death. In other words, while we were under the dominion of sin, the only fruitage of our actions could be further condemnation and renewed certainty of the penalty of death. And all because the law of God was in force against us and giving strength to sin. Because the law defines what sin is. So when we look at Romans 3, for example, notice Romans 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, who's under the law, and every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. See that? Notice verse 20. See, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight. That's not the purpose of the law. The purpose isn't to justify us. The purpose of the law is simply to reveal what sin is. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And by the way, verse 23, all have sinned. To prevent his readers from thinking that the trouble was with the law rather than with sinful man, Paul immediately adds, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. The wages of sin, that is, the wages of law breaking, is what? Death. That is why Paul says, The commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Why? Because you break the law, you die. To make sure that no one would conclude that anything in his argument was intended to throw discredit on God's law, he declares, wherefore the law is holy, is, by the way, not was, is. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. The trouble he emphasizes once more is with sinful man. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? Carnal, sold under sin. Now he's talking about people who continue to let sin reign in their, their life. Paul explains that God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law, the just requirement of the law, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now those who walk after the Spirit are going to be keeping the law of God, not breaking it. That's the contrast Paul's making there between that of the flesh and that of the Spirit. Christ's death made possible our salvation, which in turn results not in the death of the law, but in the implanting of that law in our hearts. Thus we are enabled to bring forth fruit unto God. Even a failed marriage is no reason for abolishing the law. The law just points out the sin of adultery. And even today, adultery is sin. If the law is violated, the violators are condemned, but the law remains. God's moral law sets the standard for our lives. The law defines sin. If we violate the law, we sin and are guilty and condemned. But God's law remains. The trouble is not with the law, which is spiritual, but with us who are carnal, sold under sin. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So what about the spiritual mind? A spiritual mind would be subject to God's law, yet 
Yes, if the carnal mind is not, the spiritual mind is. While we are sold under sin, enslaved in the bondage of sin, we are under the domination rule of the old man. That domination is broken by the death of the old man and the putting on of the new man. Conversion, born again, accepting Jesus into your heart as your own personal Savior. In our former state before our conversion, the law pointed to our guilt and condemnation. In our redeemed state, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us, for the law is written in our hearts. That's the new covenant. Romans 7, 6 reads, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. What does he mean by delivered from the law? We've already proven that the law still exists. So what does Paul mean by delivered from the law? Does that mean we don't have to keep it? If Paul here teaches the death of the law, the Ten Commandments means the law no longer applies to one who has died with Christ, he contradicts himself. Because listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother. Where did he get that commandment? That's in the Ten Commandments. That's in the Ten Commandments. Notice what Paul says in verse 12. The law is holy. Notice verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. That's what happens when sin reigns in your life. You're carnal. You're carnal. Notice verse 22, Paul says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the heart. I delight. Now why would he delight in the law that no longer exists? Paul speaks of the death of a husband and applies this death to the death of the old man. In the fourth verse, he speaks of our becoming dead to the law. Does he turn around in the sixth verse to tell us that it is the law that is dead and no longer applies? The death Paul speaks of is not the death of the law, but rather our death of the old man and the putting on of the new man, being the new man married to Jesus our Savior. See, the penalty of sin comes with breaking the law. Before a person is convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit, before he has found pardon and justification in Christ, he faces the penalty of death for sin. But in accepting Christ, he is released from the death penalty for breaking the law and is made free from that penalty because of Christ's death on the cross. Isn't that good news? So these verses in Romans chapter 7, 1 through 4, have to do with being delivered from the penalty of the law through the death of Jesus on the cross. This makes sense. No contradictions to this. The first verse reads, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. This certainly proves that Paul was not teaching that this law had become dead and was no longer operative against the transgression. For how could a dead law have dominion over a man as long as he lives? Did you get that question? I'm going to read it again. For how could a dead law have dominion over a man as long as he lives? By the way, Leviticus 6, 4 says, He, that, he has sinned and is what? Guilty. Now we're going to get to something very interesting here as we close in just a minute. Watch this. Remember what we said about the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. When a man claims, listen carefully, right here it is. When a man claims that because he has become justified by faith, he is above law and can steal, lie, commit adultery, or live in violation of any of the other commandments without forfeiting his justification and returning to a state of condemnation, 
He is only deceiving himself. I'm saved. I could go kill somebody if I want. I'm saved. I could go commit adultery. I'm saved. I could go, um, I could go steal my neighbor's car. He's deceiving himself. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. Know ye not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 6. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 6. Listen to this. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Wait a minute. I thought dead to the law means that it's okay now because it's dead to the law. You don't have to keep it. Nor adulterers, nor infaminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Friends, you must be born again. You must be converted. Put on the new man, not the old man. The old man does all that. James 2, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art. That means that's exactly what you are. You are a transgressor of the law. And Del Ratzler said James 2.11 is the Ten Commandments. We may be sure there is nothing in the seventh chapter of Romans or any other part of the Bible contrary to this. The second verse continues this thought. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law of what? Faithfulness and fidelity to her husband. So long as he lives. As long as this husband lives, she is to keep herself only to him. As she promised in the marriage vow, but if he dies, she does no wrong in marrying another man. Paul makes it clear it was the husband and not the law that died. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of what? Fidelity of her husband. It is the husband that dies. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Verse 3. For in so doing, she violates two laws. Number one, that of fidelity, which she owed to her husband. And number two, the seventh commandment, which forbids adultery. But if her husband be dead, not either of these laws, she is free from that law of fidelity, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And here are the three things. The woman, the law, the husband, which of these three died? If the woman be dead... That is not what it says, does it? If the law be dead, that is not what it says. If the husband be dead, that is what it says. How pleasing it would be to the no law teachers if it read, but if the law be dead, that is what they are trying to prove, but it does not read that way. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law. It does not say the law has become dead, but you are become dead. You also are become dead to the law, to the judicial penalty of the law to which they were bound as the woman to the husband. You also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Notice the words by the body of Christ. This expression means by the death of Christ on the cross. Peter says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. 1 Peter 2.24. Did Jesus' death on the cross abolish the Ten Commandments or the death penalty for breaking the Ten Commandments? Which? Which one? The second. The death penalty for breaking the Ten Commandments. Paul says that Christ, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2.9 Why did he taste death for every man? Because death passed upon all men. Romans 5.12 So Christ's death was to cancel the penalty, not the law itself. The penalty. 
Paul's point when the woman who has been married to this sentence of death, which is true of all of us, receives Christ, she is then and there loosed from that sentence, husband, and married to another, even Christ. If we continue in our transgression, if we willfully violate sin against any of the Ten Commandments, we are still bound to that husband of death. So if while we are living in this transgression, we claim we are married to Christ, such a life is one of what? Spiritual adultery. Let that soak in. Having been liberated from this death which passed upon all men, we are at the same time discharged from the law, Romans 7, 6. This text does not imply that we are free to steal, lie, commit adultery, murder, etc. But that we are discharged from the death sentence by the body of Christ. Now I'll tell you what, I've been in prison ministries and talked to some of those guys who are on death row. When they accept Jesus Christ, they may still be sent to the death chamber. They still may, may be put in the gas chamber or electric chair. But they've been free from the bondage of sin in Jesus Christ. As Paul goes on to explain, that being dead wherein we were held. The fact that this release was accomplished by the body of Christ proves it was the death that passed upon all men which becomes judicially dead when a person accepts the gospel. He becomes discharged from the law. Discharged from the law. These words, discharged from the law, are legal terms. A man pays another man's penalty and the judge says to the prisoner, you are discharged, sir. Now does the law still stand? If he goes out and does those very things he was accused of, again, is he going to be put right back in jail? So being discharged from the law doesn't do away with the law, does it? It does not mean discharged to go out and violate the law again, but discharged from what? The penalty. So on the cross, Christ paid our penalty and thus made it possible for us to be discharged from the law's death sentence. Then we become dead to that wherein we were held. The bondage of sin, namely the death penalty. The wages of sin is death. Our allegiance to that husband has terminated because he became dead by the body of Christ. Then we become married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we, the new man, should bring forth fruit unto God. Not the old man, the new man. In order to make it plain that he was not arguing that the law is dead and no longer operative against the transgressor, Paul goes on to say, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. How could any commandment of a dead law condemn a living man for coveting? Violating it wouldn't be sin if the law that prohibited this violation didn't exist. Such a thing would be impossible. But the very fact that Paul quotes the 10th commandment of the law, the Ten Commandments, and goes on to say that it is this law that reveals the knowledge of sin, this positively proves it was still in force and very much alive. Paul uses the term law in reference to the Ten Commandments. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. The same thing would be equally true of the fourth commandment or any other commandment of the Ten Commandments in the same law thou shalt not covet. The law that still exists, including the fourth commandment, as well as any other commandment of the Ten Commandments. For example, Paul mentions adultery and covet in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Both found in the Ten Commandments. But are we to conclude that only these two are the law? 
simply because Paul doesn't mention the other commandments in the same law? All who are willfully violating them, while at the same time claiming they are married to Christ, are living in spiritual adultery. The theory that justification by faith is taught in the New Testament makes void the law and gives license to disobey the commandments of God only does so to evade the observance of the Lord's holy Sabbath. But since this faith by which the sinner is justified does not make void the law but establishes it, the Sabbath is also established since it is a part of the same Law, Ten Commandments. Paul's point is that we are simply delivered from the penalty of the law that indeed condemnation and penalty of the law is what? Dead. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Sin is breaking the law. So, false interpretation. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. The law is dead. We're dead to the law. True interpretation. We are no longer under the death penalty that the law condemns. The death of Jesus on the cross paid the penalty we deserve. This is what Paul's talking about. This is what Paul's talking about. Is everybody clear? Anybody confused? Did I make it clear? Plain? Straightforward? Everybody understand? In our next study, we're going to do Nehemiah chapter 9 Verses 13 and 14 in our next study. See, people take these texts right here. Listen to this. Notice Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes, and commandments. Now notice verse 14. And madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. This text is supposed to prove that the Sabbath didn't exist until God made us known unto them thy holy Sabbath during the time of Moses. So this is a text they use all the time. In other words, prior to Moses, the Sabbath did not exist because God made known unto them thy holy Sabbath. So we're going to look at that in our next study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for our study this evening. We thank you for the time we could come together and study your word. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.